Volume Podcast. Hi, and welcome to the Volume Podcast. My name is Filippo Forattini, and I'm part of Kunumi, the makers of this podcast. Today we're going to continue our exploration in the relationship between humans and robots. Today, specifically, we'll talk about human-robot interaction in the military. Our guest, Julie Carpenter, has a PhD in education psychology from the University of Washington and explores the relationship between humans and robots, not only in the military, but also regarding sex robots and other forms of interaction. So it was a very interesting episode, and Dr. Carpenter will tell us some very curious stories about attachment between robots and humans in the military environment. So thank you for being here, and let's go. Hi, my name is Dr. Julie Carpenter, and I'm a research fellow in the Ethics and Emerging Sciences Group, which is part of California Polytechnic State University. And my research is about human behavior with emerging technology, and that's usually artificial intelligence in different forms, whether that's web-based or robots or AR, virtual reality, all sorts of things. Hi, Julie. Welcome. So, uh what led you here? What brought you up to this point? When you look back, what do you think it's yours? What were your main reasons? <laughs> Why do I think my, my journey, how did my journey get me here? That's such a, a meandering question. I think uh, for a lot of people in tech that are probably, especially maybe uh, around my age, people that started 20, 30, you know, even longer ago, where everything was just sort of, especially the web was just, you know, coming into being and we were discovering its its power, its capabilities and its limitations. So I actually started <laughs> going way back to the beginning. I have to laugh. This is making me think way, way back. I actually, and I think this is relevant, it's important. I started with a real uh, interest in art history, and I was going to be an art history major in college, um, especially European art history, medieval through Renaissance. I was so interested in, in um, that particular period and the way, especially in, in Italy uh, in particular, the way the church was so integral in uh, sponsoring some of the art that we consider great art in the West today and the politics and the complexities of all of that. Um, but I didn't pursue that. Uh, I was more into the film program at the time at my university, which that doesn't sound perhaps like a huge shift because you're still in the arts really. Um, and I, again, sort of like with art history, I wasn't interested in being an artist. I knew my own limitations. I was interested in the stories, the hagiography, the stories of the saints, the stories of the artists, the stories of the church and why they backed certain artists and, and not others. And sort of similarly with film, I'd always loved movies. Lots of people love movies, but I sort of turned my hobby into um, pursuing the interest in film as a medium. Uh, the university I went to uh, had a very strong program, not in film production. Again, I, I never saw myself as an artist. I saw myself as, I'm more the, uh, the observer. I'm always the observer. So I, the being a, a film theory person gave me an opportunity to watch a lot of movies, to talk about movies, to read about movies, to learn about history, but more importantly, to learn about the theoretical frameworks, I think about filmmaking, about all of the complexities of people making their choices, um, choices directors make, writers make, actors make, uh, lighting people make, right? Because I had to take some production classes. I couldn't get away. Camera, you know, all of these choices that all of these artists make. Uh, fil editing, that's a strong one. I really enjoyed editing uh, a whole lot. I almost went into, I, I had a burning desire, really, if I was going to go into film was to do editing. That was really interesting to me. But um, into the storytelling, and then you put it in this film medium, which at the time was just turning to sort of home video. Uh, cable had been around, of course. 
um, uh, movies really weren't on the internet. They certainly weren't on very quickly. So people were still watching them largely in theaters. And that's a whole different experience, right? Especially maybe as we've learned, it resonates even today with the pandemic and people unable to go to theaters and watching at home and how that changes the experience. And uh, so it's movies are very complex, right? Even the simplest sort of silliest comedy um, can have very, um, it goes through a very complicated set of filters and lenses, and I don't mean camera lenses, I mean points of view of all of these people that get together and make this story. And then all the individuals that absorb the story. And then there's a couple of things. One is the audience might have some larger cultural agreement. And by that, I mean, like, we love the movie, we hate the movie, you know, the majority of people, how many tomatoes did it get on Rotten Tomatoes? You know, we go to see what the majority of reviews were. Did everybody love this Star Wars movie or did they hate it? <coughs> Excuse me. And then there's the individual aspect, what we bring to what we see. And I still find that so endlessly fascinating, like much like a good book, but I find it so more with movies, maybe because they're shorter in, in many ways, but, and they're visual and they impact you differently. But, you know, we've all had the experience. You can watch a movie as a child, watch it as a teenager, watch it as an adult, and it's going to resonate very differently because you're at a different place in your life. So you have the memories of the film, that can resonate with you, but your own experience. And something that comes to mind for myself when I think of this is The Sound of Music. Uh, that was a movie when I was little. Uh, they still only showed maybe once a year on TV. You couldn't get it on video. You didn't watch it on cable. And there were special events, right? You could only watch it on TV in, in the United States. It tended to be around Christmas or Thanksgiving. So when I was little, it was a special event. My mother loved musicals. So it was a big deal. She loved Sound of Music. She'd spent time in Austria as a child. She had very deep memories of it. Her parents were a Holocaust survivor, so the Nazi theme was a big deal. Uh, so this was a very resonant movie for her. So we watched it, and then it became important to me and had significance. As I got older, boy, did I love the character of Liesel who was the teenage girl who I think a lot of little girls, maybe especially at that time, the 70s, the 80s, whatever, would just admire her. her the actor and the character are lovely, beautiful, elegant. She does ballet. She sings, right? And you're not looking at her with any sort of a critical eye as a child, right? So as a little girl, I wanted to grow up and be Liesel. And then as I got older, I realized her boyfriend was a Nazi. <laughs> And she made some really poor decisions in her life, even though she ended up, you know, siding with her family at the end. But I became more critical of the choices Liesl made. And now as an adult, I can sort of forgive Liesl, which sounds ridiculous. My, my grandparents were Nazis, you know, Holocaust survivors, whatever. But, you know, it's a story. It's based on a true story, but this part is completely, you know, made up. I can remove myself. I can go, this story was situated in this time, and it was made, you know, 20, 30 years after it took place. You know, and, you know, and I understand it from a, a, an adult perspective, and I've sort of come full circle while I can enjoy it again. I don't enjoy it with that same sense of fantasy and magical thinking I did when I was five years old. But now it gives me nice memories of sitting on the sofa with my mom and my mom loving it. And my mom telling me stories about Austria and, and her parents and things like that. So I think to myself that that's sort of an example of a story that can be revisited. So having said that, that was a big part of my journey, which sounds weird because then I went into tech. Um, I went into communications. Uh, I lived in Wisconsin, the Midwest of the United States. Not a lot of film jobs out there. <laughs> and somehow, again, I hadn't really seen myself in film. I didn't know really what I was going to do with that degree. Honestly, I didn't. Um, I went into communications. It was around Y2K. 
I happened to be working uh, in a financial lobbying group. So things were hitting the fan, shall we say, uh, in not a good way. I guess that's a, an American euphemism, but it, you know, it, 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 things were not going well. There was a lot of, if you weren't around for Y2K or you don't remember, um, you know, the web was relatively new. People were still learning how to navigate it, whether or not they could trust it. And here I was working in banking. We were trying to convince people that it was okay to do their banking online, that you could trust bankers, period. Um, uh, and my job was giving those messages and, and I was getting a lot of pushback. It was Y2K. People were critical. What happens when the year 2000 comes along? Is all my money going to disappear? What happens to the world? Whatever. So anyway, I could see um, how the internet, even though I enjoyed it, I enjoyed uh, all of the things of the web and the communication and that it was a medium and everything. I could see uh, people's mistrust and how it was creating all of these things. So then I decided that doing this back end coding wasn't as interesting to me as the, the human interaction part. So I started doing a lot of reading on my own. I discovered there were some people actually studying this, which was a very new user centered and human centered research about how people interact with things like the web was very new. Though of course there had been scholarly work about how people interact with all sorts of other technologies, right? Um, but I was very into that. And uh, then I transitioned into a role at another place working in medicine, <laughs> which then was also another hot button issue at the time where people were just getting access to their patient medical records online. Now we understand and we trust, we don't even think about it. Go on our phones, I need to make a doctor's appointment or I'm gonna have, uh, I'm gonna meet with my doctor on my phone, no biggie. Uh, but at the time it was so convoluted and so difficult and it, it was problematic from a back end technology issue and it was problematic from the trust issue. And then one more thing that led me on my path, and that was I saw the work of David Hansen on the news, on CNN, actually. David Hansen is a roboticist. Uh, Hansen Robotics, uh, people might know his work through Sophia the Robot that looks, he designed to look like a combination sort of of his wife and Audrey Hepburn. Um, she's been in the news a lot, so they might be familiar with that. David's work came out of Walt Disney and Disney World. So he started uh, as an Imagineer and doing very lifelike robots. Uh, I had no idea that robotics was moving so swiftly in such a lifelike direction that it was even possible. Now, David had invented at the time um, a synthetic, it's called an exoskeleton. People might think of that as sort of like an artificial skin to put on robots. Uh, called Frubber, I, and I think he still uses a version of it today. It was, at the time, it was the most lifelike type of skin out there, and um, it was just, his work is still amazing from an artistic standpoint. Um, he's a great artist and visionary in that way. Uh, and anyway, it inspired me to look deeply into robots, and to me, at the time, robots were just like blowing my mind as the ultimate medium to sort of test all of these theories I was learning about, um, about all the decisions people make in creating something like this. So many decisions. There's the research that has to be done, the technology that's available, the technology that has to be invented, all the people who invented every little piece of it from the hair, the skin, the eyes, how it moves. You know, you've got the, the, the sensors, the motors, the batteries, you know, does it walk? Is it balanced? And that's the thing that the technical side is moving as rapidly as the artistic side at this point in the early to mid 2000s. So at one point, robots, you know, were more like R2D2. If they resembled people at all, if you say R2D2 is human like in that it's got something that resembles two arms, it's something you recognize as a head, right? It's human like in that way. But they would move around on wheels or things like that if they moved at all. 
Now robots were all of a sudden not only able to stand, but then within a few years they were walking, tethered uh, to something, but walking in place. Then they were walking untethered. That you know, and then it was very rapid. That um, and all of these things uh, really intrigued me about when people start coming across these science fiction robots in our everyday lives, that's a lot of complicated science fiction technology coming at you very quickly, right? And I say science fiction because that's where we reach back to as a point of reference when uh, we haven't encountered something before. And these are things that are in our physical space. You can turn them off like a computer, but they're still in your space. And there are just all of these questions I had that I figured the only way to work in the, the field that wasn't even called human-robot interaction at the time, but the only way I could figure out anything about this was to get my PhD. So that was the, the very long and winding road to how I then, um, went to University of Washington, uh, decided to, I was very welcomed by College of Education. I started at College of Engineering, but actually College of Education is the one that welcomed me um, really about the nuances of that human interaction with robots, um, especially, so my degree is in educational psychology. Um, uh, which is my focus was about how people learn in formal and informal environments. So a formal environment, you might think about a school or at work where you have specific training or education or a curriculum, right? And informal learning is how we learn from other people, how we learn from the world around us, how we learn from culture without even necessarily, you know, you're not doing it like on purpose all the time, right? You absorb it. So um, my work is usually culturally situated. I don't always work with robots, um, but I, I have quite a bit. So just, uh, yeah, that's the long and winding road about my work. Thank you so much for that. I truly have a passion about this question and I love the long answers. So I love to see, you know, all the details and paths that led um, you somewhere uh, because you know we're all asking the same questions i'm asking these questions so you know where will this lead me i have no idea so um how is your work today so how do you translate this path into work into work <laughs> that's a good question so um wow uh so this path has been a very interdisciplinary, as you can see. Uh, even though I ended up specifically with a, a certain degree, that my my background and my interests are very interdisciplinary. And in academia and in the world, people say that that's great, but the truth is, is that can make it very difficult for people to pigeonhole you when they want to hire you for something, right? So um, it's been a little. Uh, it, it reminds me of something Cliff Nass said. Dr. Cliff Nass was a mentor of mine. He sadly passed away now, but he was a professor at Stanford um, in this field. It reminds me of, of something he said to me a long time ago. He was ex incredibly successful as a scholar and very influential, and I'm not comparing my work to his, but something he said resonated with me. And that was basically that every time he wrote a piece or spoke about something that was very popular and captured the public's imagination, then he was pigeonholed in that for a long time. So he wrote about um, like web-based digital assistants and things like Clippy, right? So then for a long time, he was like the Clippy guy. You know, he wrote a, a, a book about how people, you know, interact with computers. Then he was like the computer guy, he wrote about robots. He was the pigeonholed as the robot guy for a couple of years. Um, so uh, I find that that can be, a, 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 I don't want to say a, a problem, but it can be a challenge as a social scientist when people don't sort of see that the connecting dot is 
I'm interested in human behavior. So the technology for me, I can intellectualize any technology. Some it really fascinate me, like robots sort of endlessly fascinate me, but I can really intellectualize most technologies and be interested in them because I'm interested in how people interact with them. And that's the similarity that resonated with me, like that Cliff said. So um, when you say, how does that turn into work? I say sort of all over the place. I've worked places where my work has been strictly like human behavior with things that are web-based, um, human behavior with things that are robots. I, I've, I've done a lot of work in, in that area and people might have um, heard generally not about my book because my book has a very small <laughs> nerdy niche but uh just in general about soldiers uh, sometimes becoming attached to robots and that's sort of based on some military research uh that i did a few years ago i've written about uh, people's emotional and, and done research about people's emotional attachment to robots and their sexual interest in robots and um, had jobs where uh, as a consultant, as a research scientist, my job is to look at human behavior with all sorts of tech, again, from web-based to AR, VR, to um, uh, autonomous vehicles, all sorts of things. And Julie, how was your work with the military and robots? I'm extremely curious about this. Um, so what can you tell us about that research. Yeah. So, boy, uh, where do I start with that one, too? I'll try not to go back too far. I won't go back to, like, high school or something. <laughs> so, uh, okay. So, my interest in the military and robots, I'm really not sure where that started. Maybe, like, everybody else with, like, movies like Terminator and things like that. Because, again, I'm not going to dismiss science fiction before robots were part of our world, right? And it we got to experience them through storytelling and fables. And uh, actually, I'm going to go back just a tiny bit because the storytelling is important here. Um, you know, there are stories about humans, usually men, creating artificial life that go back cross-culturally all around the world thousands of years, right? From Greek mythology, you know, we've got stories in the West, in the East, all around the world about people create, and usually what happens, it's about people creating artificial life and it being flawed and then all hell breaking loose, whether it's Frankenstein or Pinocchio or Terminator, right? Things like that. So why am I fascinated by Terminator? That sounds like a terrible story so, to be fascinated by. But when you break it down intellectually, if you break it down actually in an academic way, stories like that are super interesting because the military, historically, we all know, is the place that has the money to do research first. Usually they can invest lots of money in all kinds of scientific research that they think is going to have positive outcomes for warfare one way or another, tactical strategy outcomes, whatever it is. So they had invested heavily in robotics. Uh, U.S. military, like a lot of governments, Australia, Japan is investing heavily in robotics for their own reasons. Um, uh, and that in itself is very interesting, right? Because military... So first of all, it's got a military lens. So we understand the outcomes are going to be to either keep people safe, to harm people generally, right? Uh, then the military is such a, an interesting, closed, odd microcosm of culture. On the one hand, it's highly structured. You literally, during induction or a basic training, it's commonly known as, you know, you go through those six to eight weeks or whatever it is, depending on which branch of the military you're in, they literally teach you, reteach you how to do everything. They teach you, like, for example, how to tie your shoes the army way, brush your teeth the army way, make your bed the army way. You're taught how to sort of be yourself a new version of yourself very quickly culturally you become uh indoctrinated into this and you need to be it's a very careful cultural thing they need people to be able to react according to orders without being critical right and uh that's the point 
and to bring people up to a certain level skill set. So it's a very interesting cultural environment. But yet, people from all sorts of backgrounds enter the military. People who maybe had no choice uh, monetarily, economically, people who did it because there's a history of their family entering the military, did it for college money, uh, did it because they were convinced by a cool commercial, you know, did it for, you know, personal reason, all sorts of reasons. So you get black people, white people, brown people, you know, all sorts of people, levels of education, super interesting environment, right? Uh, to me, anyway. Uh, then you add robots. Uh, where do I start? Well, the, I mean, literally, as, a, as somebody doing their dissertation, this was my dissertation topic, where do I start? I was lucky I had, um, I, or not lucky, I mean, in all the research I did, one of my initial contacts, because I had, this was not military funded research, let me be clear. This was funded by my research center at school. So there was no military funding. I had no in to the military. One of the people that I met who was a recruiter for the army, and he worked at a base that happened to be within an hour from me. Um, and he said, you should be talking to explosive ordnance disposal folks, or otherwise known as EOD, uh, commonly known as maybe the bomb squad people. So what they do is they disarm any, any unexploded ordnance, whether that's IEDs or improvised explosive devices, mines, um, chemical weapons, you know, uh, uh, nuclear weapons, weapons in the air, weapons, you know, underwater, weapons on land. It's a very dangerous job. And because of the nature of their work, they've been using robots in the military for like the last 30, 40 years. Um, different iterations, of course. Uh, some much clunkier, it, it still tend to be clunky. Um, they're, you know, as the nature of their work changes and as robotics has changed. Um, it, so it's important to understand that they, this is a group of people who now use robots in their work every day because it can keep them at a safe distance or a safer distance from the unexploded ordinance. Uh, and, uh, Again, these are people who have a history of working with robots. They're educated about how to work with the robots. They understand what they are. And it's a very critical tool. I should mention these robots do not resemble people at all, at least the robot when I was working with this, this group of folks. At the time, too, there were only about maybe 5,000 people as EOD, maybe. They don't release the exact numbers. Um, uh, in the U.S. military, across all branches, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines. Um, because of the nature of the work, it's very specialized uh, and difficult. You have to go through a very long sort of uh, extra specialized training to be a part of it. So anyway, um, anyway, I just throw aside all the research I did. So I got to that point. And that was, fa I mean, how much more fascinating is that? Uh, you're talking People that are, and they're not, the robots they use are not weaponized because their job is to keep people safe, basically, from any unexploded ordnance. So, so if I may, um, it's very interesting how, although you're talking about a research with a military robot, there's also an element of storytelling, the way you talk about your research. So this would be a really interesting movie argument. I hadn't thought of it that way, but that's interesting. Good, put that out there. <laughs> <laughs> so, and what was next? I mean, uh, how was the process? What and, and what happened? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, people are always curious. Like, what did you? What were the findings? Get to the findings. Yeah, I'm, I'm, so, not, I'm not in a rush. No, no, no. It, it, no that's that's the juicy part. I get it. So, um, uh. I had the opportunity to speak to 23 people, 22 of which were men and one woman. And frankly, at the time, that was almost about uh, correct uh, demographically uh, because it was very male dominated uh, at the time. Uh, it's, it's sort of getting better in a way. Uh, 
23 people, if you're looking for statistical significance, I, I do need to talk about this. This is not about statistical significance. This is not experimental research. This is what's called exploratory work. So these are more like case studies. You present the work. It's rigorously analyzed. I interview people was one form of the data I collected, which is analyzed in its own way. And one of the ways that you present this, what's called narrative data, when people share their own experiences with you, is when you come across significant patterns across data and within what they say, you can present that as, as, as stories, like you said, you can tell the stories. You say, this is one significant pattern of experiences that we found. Um, and these are some of the stories and anecdotes that the soldiers shared. So um, one of the storylines was definitely, uh, <laughs> so I should say that I, I, I asked people, I did a, a short question and answer of, structured questions before and at the end of each interview. And one of the questions I asked was for them to describe a robot in their own words. And at the beginning of the interview, they would have very rote, often almost memorized, a robot is a mechanical device that blah, blah, blah. They always used unanimously the word, you know, mechanical, uh, you know, something machine-like, you know. I would ask the same question, tell me in your own words what a robot is, define a robot for me, at the end of our interview. And the answers then, after they had reflected, were so different. That alone was interesting to me. Because then they would say, after they had talked about it, and talked about it with me, who is a stranger, who they felt was not going to judge them, and had a sympathetic ear, right? Then they would say, and I, I'm not one of their buddies, right? So no one's going to make fun of them or anything. So it's a safe space, as we say. They would say, you know, now that I think about it, we did treat it a little bit like, you know, a mascot or a buddy or, or even a girlfriend in that, you know, I, I slept with it in the cab of the truck all the time and we called it this girl's name or whatever. So they started to give it attributes um, that were either human-like or animal-like. Um, so that was interesting. Yeah, and some people go, yeah, but people do that to guns, to boats, to cars. Well, that's a little different. Uh, guns and boats and cars, you don't tend to give complete separate personas to, as if they're living and telling their own stories. That's not typical. You might name your car, but you don't necessarily give it its own storyline and, and treat it, you know, celebrate its birth day or, or when you've had a successful drive together. But there were a lot of rituals people were connecting these robots. And, and again, you know, playful, not that they gave meaning that this robot was the same meaningful relationship as a human, not at all, or that it was the same meaningfulness even as an animal, a canine unit. But this robot in some ways takes over that role. It takes uh, over uh, a critical and dangerous role than in the past a human would have had to do to approach the unexploded ordinance, and humans still have to do when the robots can't do it, or what a canine would have had to do. Furthermore, the robots are tend to be smaller. Uh, there's a couple models they use. One is about the size of a backpack, uh, and one is much larger. It tends to be used for things like disarming vehicle uh, born IEDs, things like that. But they're still smaller than, than full-blown cars. They move in your space. People know that they're controlled. They're only, they're only somewhat intelligent, right? Uh, they're controlled remotely. People know that. But that gives them, uh, it gives you the illusion that this robot is autonomous, that it's making decisions that are smart. You don't get that feeling with a gun, with a boat, uh, with an automobile, uh, yet, right? <laughs> that it's making its own decisions without you, that it has a sense of autonomy. And we have, again, because we're at this point culturally where robots are new to us, even if you are in the military and, and, and everything and having this experience, um, where we still have this science fiction uh, uh, priming 
about our expectations that inform that. And, you know, I found that a lot of the names for the robots were either, you know, often they were female, not surprising, named after girlfriends, significant others, celebrities, uh, pop stars, things like that, but also given uh, pet names, dog names in particular, again, because this is a role that would often be taken over by canine. Also named after popular robots in movies, right? So they definitely had those science fiction references. So what's significant about these findings too is that we know anecdotally people can think an Ibo puppy robot is cute or that they can have an uncanny feeling, right, about something that's a human-like robot. We know this anecdotally. But we also knew anecdotally there were reports that soldiers were interacting with robots in these ways. But nobody had had an opportunity or the time to look at it from a social science viewpoint and say what's actually really happening and emerging. I want to be clear that not all soldiers reported this there did seem to be an age difference um but you know yeah uh also sort of not surprising i wish i could have pursued it further and i say not surprising because at the time again this was a few years ago uh the robots older folks had worked with were different were clunky uh these newer ones were smoother and also they had controls that were uh, modeled, they looked exactly like video game controls on purpose, so people could learn them very quickly. Uh, so people had, uh, younger folks had a very, they grew up with video games, this was a natural interaction. And let me just add another finding was that the operator saw the robots as an extension of themselves. So it's like an avatar for them. They would say, you know, the robot is my eyes at a distance, it's my arms at a distance, it's my hands at a distance. Uh, it is. It's a representation of themselves in a different physical space. Like you see in video games where people might have a, a common um, experience where you can get attached to an avatar, right? You created it, you molded it, you might make it look like you, you might not, but it has some, it has some of you in it. It represents you in a different space, right? In a virtual space. And there were similarities to how the operators felt about the robots. So uh, did that change how they worked with the robots? I, 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 that's, you know, I'm not gonna make calls about that because that wasn't sort of the purpose of what I was investigating in that work. But the thing is that robots are changing. Uh, the, the US military and other militaries around the world have said specifically they're turning to more human-like and animal-like robots, dog-like robots, human-like robots. Very specific reasons. It's not to spook people or anything, but that tends to be what it does, right? Um, uh, uh, the theory is, is that, for example, a four-legged or quadruped robot can move on a lot more different terrains nimbly than a tracked or wheeled robot or a two-legged robot. A robot that is shaped like a human can use human-like tools, interact, and think about the world as designed for human shapes able-bodied human shapes usually, but still human shapes. Um, so it makes sense in a lot of ways to have a robot that can move in those spaces. And also when you're talking about teleoperation, if I'm a human being and I'm wearing sensors and I'm operating a robot at a distance, whether that's in outer space or an EOD robot that's 50 feet or 100 yards from me, if I'm wearing sensors on my hands, you know, my head, my legs, whatever, and I'm moving, it makes sense then, right? For the robot to move in that way. So um, I feel that, you know, that things, the relationship people have with these robots is only going to get more complicated. And that means decision making is going to get more complicated. It's going to change our culture. It's, it's going to change a lot of things. Um, so that, that was the premise of that work. And, and after the dissertation, um, I was lucky enough to be approached to write a book about it. So I do have a, a scholarly book out there about it. That's cool. And, um, but there's, there's something that comes to mind is that in this relationship, also, if the soldier does its work wrong, it blows the robot up. So this is, 
I, I'm already anxious about it. I'm not even controlling any robots. Yeah, so that sense of loss was was real for some soldiers. I was very interested in, did it affect their decision-making, right? We're talking about very critical decision-making in the moment. And a lot of soldiers in general, regardless of their mission of service, will say, unless you're in you know, a, a conflict or war right then, it can be a lot of downtime, and then your call to action, and then a lot of adrenaline and decision, critical decision-making and everything. So from a physical standpoint, you you have a lot of hormones running through your body. You're called to make very critical life-changing decisions in the moment, right? So I was interested in, you know, is it, does it affect how much are people attached to these? So I'm glad you brought that up. The soldiers I talked to said it was no question, you know, if in the moment, it, I mean, clearly people are more important than these robots or, or anything else. That wasn't a, a factor. And I, I'm glad you asked. I want to be clear about that. But my question is, you know, as, as these robots get more lifelike, I think that that could be problematic. If you're sending a robot that resembles a dog, you've named it, you have little rituals for it, you celebrate successful missions with it. Um, What's going to happen when you you send it out there? Now, this is not to uh, question the soldier's ability at all. Um, and I think that if that becomes a challenge, culturally, people will shift past that very quickly and understand that this is a specific tool. But I think from a social science point of view, what's also interesting is this, this adds to the body of emerging work that we're considering robots as their own social category. So uh, we're not quite seeing them as animals or humans, right? We don't, so you see a lot of headlines, you know, as you get into the sex robots and the love robots, you know, are people gonna love robots instead of people? Are people, you know, what if you have robot caretakers? Is that the, ro is that, as you're older, is that the most horrible thing in the world? It's not about replacing human care, human friendship, human bonding, animal bonding, any of that. It could be about, and I think it is, a new set of social categories. And humans are great at categorizing socially, you know, everybody around them. That's how we navigate life. We code switch, right? We change how we decide how much we're going to share and how we're going to regard other people. You might, you walk past people on the street and in the United States, you don't generally say something. If I was, you know, taking an evening walk and maybe in another country, maybe in a small town in Italy uh, and people smile and say hi to each other and they're strangers in the evening, right? Uh, you talk to, you know, someone at the grocery store, I talk to a podcast interviewer, I talk to my friends and my parents all in different ways, right? We all have different social categories. Uh, you regard your pet differently, right? That's its own similarity. And, and I think that that's how we're sort of seeing robots emerge. And how does impactful research changed you and changed your vision of the world? Okay, how the, you know, I have to say the, the military research I did, it did change me. I had always thought that I was an advocate for the user. I think in a lot of ways that that's an important part of, of my job and human-centered design, human-centered research is the primacy is on the human not the technology, right? So a lot of times my role, I feel like as a consultant is to say, don't forget the humans, don't forget the people as, you know, who are we designing for? Who is this for? But I think the military research I did, even though I knew, I knew intellectually what they had gone through as, as soldiers and experienced as disposal ordinance disposal personnel, was work I could not fathom. Um, but when I heard their stories, uh, uh, just about their everyday work, um, about the dangers of it, about things that they had seen or been through, uh, that 
I, I mean, I can't lie to this day. Some of those things haunt me. And I think that as a social scientist, as anybody who works with people who are in pain or have suffered trauma, uh, that no matter how much you want to professionally remove yourself, those stories are going to stay with you. They're not just stories, right, that are written down. Um, and you can remove yourself from. Someone has trusted you to share those with you. And uh, quickly, I'll share an anecdote because I think it's important to what you said. Um, I usually did those interviews one-on-one. -on -one. I very much wanted to give them that space to talk about anything. There was one person, a, a male soldier, I was going to speak to meet with at a cafe. And his wife was a little like, who's this woman who's this college student, which is funny. I think she had a weird mental picture of me that wants to meet you in a cafe for an hour. <laughs> I, I'm not sure what was going through her head, but you know, I, 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 whatever, you know. So I said, she can come and observe, but I would really appreciate it if she sat at a different table so we could have our own space, but you know. So it was very unusual situation, but you know, it, that's fine. Um, and after he and I had talked, and he had shared some pretty grisly um, anecdotes about what he had been through as an explosive ordnance disposal thing. And afterwards, she came up to me very moved, and she could overhear what we were saying, but she didn't interrupt, which, you know, points for her. And she said, he talked to you and told you things he never told me. And I said to her, that's not because he and I, I mean, partly because we had a rapport, but it's because I'm a stranger and he's trying to save you the pain of what he went through. He's protecting you, I think, you know? It's because he loves you, right? It's easier to talk to me about it. And um, that was great for him. And it was great for me to get a better understanding of things. But uh, that, I always... When people trust me with their pain, I take that very seriously. Uh, and that never goes away. I keep it in my heart. And the same when I, any users, really. But frankly, I, I do work a lot with people who have been traumatized or have been hurt or have been judged about their relationships with robots. When I talk about people who love robots and have sexual relationships with them um, and sometimes have very complicated emotional backgrounds. And I feel very protective of them. And I think that that's okay. Um, uh, I think that that can be good as a social scientist and for me to be transparent about it, to say, I care about them as humans. That's what motivates me in my work. And their stories don't turn me off to the work. It makes me more motivated to take my role seriously. It may not be uh, the glamorous role, it's behind the scenes, right? I'm just a nerd who like collects people's stories and analyzes them and says, here's what I found out. And sometimes people pay attention and sometimes they don't. But um, I take that very seriously and their stories all stay with me. Well, Dr. Carpenter, I think I can completely relate to what you just said. So uh, how do you see this in 10 years in the near future? In the military, I definitely see more human-like and animal-like robots. Um, and in our world, uh, I see that trend happening in the next 10 years. Some of that's because the technology is, is so rapidly advancing that way. Some of it is because of what I said earlier. We've designed our world uh, to accommodate human shapes. Uh, and human morphology, as we say, and human movement and animals, right? So it makes sense to have them move in our space. You know, if you need a robot to help you around the house, it has to probably have hands and arms that can pick up and, and do things. Um, uh, and we're going to see them increasingly in critical situations like healthcare where humans are vulnerable because they're sick and unwell, right? Um, and all of these cultural shifts are going to then happen, have to happen sort of very rapidly. We don't have a lot of time to respond and shift in culture. We've gone from like, wow, what are robots someday in the future, like the Jetsons with flying cars, to holy crap, we have actual robots in our spaces. 
oh my God, they look very lifelike. But a lot of people don't understand. They're not super intelligent yet. What you see on the news and stuff are often robots operated off screen or whatever. So definitely more intelligence we'll see in the next 10 years incorporated into robots. But I still think a lot of the advances we see are really going to be a lot in again, in the exoskeletons, what they look like, their shape, and their introduction, people are still going to try to introduce them and market them in our everyday lives. But I really think we're going to see their value in the next 10 years in things like healthcare and some of these more really vulnerable situations. Dr. Julie Carpenter, thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you so much for being here and talk to us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. If you wish to know a little bit more about the makers of this podcast, go to kunumi.com, kunumi as in K-U-N-U-M-I dot com, or follow us on Twitter at Kunumi Lab, Kunumi L-A-B. Thank you. The Volume Podcasts.